uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Payan. That was a fantastic, extensive lecture. And I think uh, the one take home message, you had multiple messages I have for the postgraduates is morphology is important. And uh, <clears throat> let, me, let me try to uh, put together this very extensive talk which you have given uh, for the sake of postgraduates. Uh, I think the first point which uh, Dr. Payan made is very relevant. Uh, you need to look at cellular features. You need to look at the behavior and the morphology of the tissue to arrive at the diagnosis. But these have limitations. And he rightly pointed out the classic example of metastasizing in pleomorphic adenoma and metastasizing in amyloblastoma, which can look bland and can metastasize and behave in a malignant manner. On the other hand, you have lesions like ancient schwannoma, which can look very upsetting, but behave in a very benign way. Or for that example, nodular fasciitis, which can have a lot of mitosis, uh, but can only be locally aggressive. So for all budding pathologists, you should be aware that morphology is the first step, behavior is the next step. And then he went on to emphasize how clinical uh, behavior also should be taken into consideration. And uh, it was a fantastic uh, acronym of Mr. Slee for round sinonasal tumors. And those of you who can't uh, memorize mnemonics are fantastic. We use that all the time in pathology. And I really liked your case selection. And I think you had a point to tell in each and every case. The first case was Ewing sarcoma, uh, which was a CD99 positive Ewing sarcoma. And uh, it was a very classic case. And he did make a mention that be careful between immunohistochemistry and immunohistochemistry infusion, because sometimes if you get a negative result, it may be a problem with the tissue also. And uh, there are a lot of issues with immunohistochemistry as to how they are fixed and things like that, especially in this part of the world. Uh, that's very important. Uh, but if you had listened carefully, uh, you quickly, very, very quickly pointed out that there are even sarcoma-like lesions. So you can depend on morphology only to a particular extent, and they may be a subset of what we've been diagnosing as Ewing's, which could be the newer lesions. I think you mentioned the CIC, Dux4 transplantation. And Ewing's now the new, ones, the new ones. Uh, the new ones. Yeah. yeah. And the BCOS, CCR, uh, CCD, and three sarcomas. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So you need to be very clear that what looks like Ewing's in immunohistochemistry and histology uh, may not have the classic T1122 translocation of Ewing's. So sometimes as our technology improves, we may be able to stratify them like what we have been doing for salivary gland tumors. Exactly. And I think the second case was a classic CD34 positive solitary fibrous tumor. And uh, that is a typical patternless pattern. And once again, if you have a confusion, you may have to resort to the STAT6, which is sort of definitive for solitary fibrous tumors. Exactly. Not necessary. Once again, only when there's a confusion. And I think case three was classic. It was a myodeep positive, straightforward alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. And this point was very nice. I mean, he elegantly pointed out what the algorithm should be. First, uh, you need to look at the shape of the cells, the pattern of the cells, the growth pattern, and then you decide the immunohistochemistry panel. And then it is cost effective for the patient and you're less likely to trip on your diagnosis. And I think uh, the fourth case was Classic spindle cell lesion, uh, where it was uh, non-definitive with IHC markers. But given the fact that it happened in a child, looked bland, did not have any mitosis, probably it is bland. If it barks like a dog, it's probably a dog. So it's probably bland. And uh, just like in our discussion of PUS, it turned out to be a fibrous hematoma. By taking into consideration the IHC, the pattern, but most importantly, the age of the patient and the clinical behavior, uh, which was a good take-home message from that particular case. And the last case was very interesting uh, because I think it was very nice to put that as a last case because you may know everything about IHC. It could be TLE1 positive, it could be other markers positive, it could be biphasic CD34, it could look like a synovial sarcoma, could have markers which are supposed to be a synovial sarcoma, but can still take a step back look at it holistically, and then it turns out to be a malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumor. So these are five classic examples of what you're likely to face uh, if you're dealing with the soft tissue sarcomas. 
And I think he did summarize about uh, the grading system, the staging system, and the, how, how we can follow the synoptics of the CAP, a clinical association of the American pathologists for using it in your center, which was so inclined. And in the staging system, it was very interesting. I think he pointed out three important factors in soft tissue tumors. One, mitosis, uh, which one day to go is 10 consecutive fields, or if you have the facility, use a KI-67. And he talked about um, a necrosis and differentiation. I think these are the three pillars of soft tissue tumor diagnosis, differentiation, mitosis, and necrosis. And I think he was quick to point out that we should differentiate between treatment-induced necrosis and a spontaneous necrosis in tumor. So this was a fantastic overview of spindle cell lesions, uh, what I think every beginner should know, and every expert should hear to sort of refresh their memory as to what is really important, take a step back and say that, oh, okay, uh, sort of a revision for all of us. Uh, let me stop here. And once again, thank you for this excellent presentation.